All right, if I could have your attention, I think I'd like to begin. Um, I just want to remind you all that your paper is due a week from today. Uh, at the end of class, I did send out an email to the entire class, uh, I think it was on Friday evening, uh, where I'd given you a few ideas. You are not restricted to those ideas. You shouldn't take them as any kind of you know, indication that those are the only things that are interesting in the novel. Those are just some thoughts that came to my mind because a couple of you at least had come to me in my office hours or had sent me emails uh, indicating that you weren't quite certain what you wanted to write about. You know, so the idea of the email is to sort of facilitate uh, your thinking about the book. And uh, uh, as I said, you know, let me repeat myself, you're not restricted to those ideas by any stretch of the imagination, okay? You can write on other things as well if you prefer. Um, let me say a couple of things more about the paper. Uh, this uh, paper, uh, the idea here is not that you're going to give me something that is going to be a absolutely you know, rigorous, really well thought out argument because the book is kind of a, in some ways a playful book. It's, it's a novel. Uh, obviously it has a very close bearing to uh, contemporary Indian history, society and politics. Uh, otherwise the book would not have been assigned to you. And uh, as you can see from the email itself that I sent to you that some of the issues that it talks about, uh, poverty, class differences, uh, the migration from rural areas to urban areas in India, the growth and development that has taken place, uh, neoliberalization, all of the things that I've actually spoken to you about in the last you know, four weeks, uh, all of these are encompassed in the novel in some way or the other. So, so your paper is, uh, uh, what I'm really looking for is you know, a kind of a thoughtful reading of the novel, that's it. Right? Uh, that, that doesn't mean a scattered set of readings. I mean, you can't write one paragraph on, on caste in, the, in, the, uh, in this novel and then one paragraph on Pinky Madam and then one, you know, one paragraph on you know, uh, Ashok and two paragraphs on Balram and just sort of you know, put it all together in that way. Obviously, there needs to be some kind of argument. Uh, but I, I want to reassure you that what you really need to do is just simply be thoughtful about the novel. And it's going to be, the papers will be graded somewhat lightly. I mean, the exam is really where you're going to be tested on the class material itself. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, the uh, portion of the requirements which is going to be graded more rigorously than, than this particular paper. Because what I want you to do in this paper is to just sort of, in some ways, as I said, you know, engage in a thoughtful exercise of trying to deconstruct the novel and, and perhaps uh, use some of the readings. You're not obligated to do that at all, but perhaps use some of the readings to try to explicate some of the points. Um, if it's still not clear what you're expected to do after what I've mentioned today and on a number of previous occasions and the email that I sent to you, then you know, by all means send me an email or, or come and see me, okay? Um, now, are there, any other, uh, are there any questions about anything that has transpired up till this point in time? Uh, any of the lectures, readings, um, anything that comes to mind. The reading has been, I suspect, probably a bit heavy up till this point in time, but that's partly because you have the novel as well. Uh, and you will see that in the second half of the course, the reading is going to considerably taper off. And of course, in week 10, there's absolutely no reading at all because they're just films. So it, it, you know, it, really, it really is planned in such a way because particularly when you get towards the end, you've got other obligations, other things to think about. So that's one of the reasons the reading is heavier uh, at this juncture than it is uh, in the second half uh, of the course. All right, uh, let me uh, uh, sort of refresh your memory about what I had done in my previous lecture. You know, I had, talking to you, uh, I had spoken to you about uh, politics in contemporary uh, India. Uh, we had looked a little bit at Sri Lanka uh, as well. Uh, but, you know, politics in contemporary South Asia, and I had made a number of analytical observations. Uh, those observations were to the following effect, that if you're looking at politics, I think it's crucial to look at a number of analytically discrete points. And those analytically discrete points have to do with such things as, for example, the question of sovereignty, right? Uh, how did India seek to exercise its sovereignty after the attainment of independence? in 1947, uh, what does it mean for a state to exercise its sovereignty, right? And what it means in part, as we said, was it means, it means that the country has to meet real or imagined external threats. Uh, not all threats that the state claims are threats are real threats, but that's why I say real or imagined threats. Uh, and these threats may be internal as well. So external threats, internal threats, uh, and this means uh, dealing with secessionist movements, 
okay? Dealing with secessionist movements, that is groups of people who want to break away from the union, right, for whatever reason, whether it's linguistic reasons, political reasons, whether they have grievances, uh, whether they think their rights are being infringed, so forth and so on, right? The second major analytical point that we had looked at was the conception of citizenship, right? Because as I pointed out to you, simply having a passport and being able to vote doesn't really tell you much about citizenship. And of course, if we use a criteria of passport, then in fact, the bulk of Indians don't carry a passport because the bulk of Indians still have not traveled outside the country. Right? Uh, but even being able to vote, and I don't want to minimize the right to vote. I think that that was an important achievement of the Constitution of India. Right? Once it was promulgated in 1950, because obviously before the attainment of independence, you didn't have universal franchise in India. And I think that people have used the vote effectively. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the most recent election uh, that's going to be concluded in the middle of May. Right? But on the other hand, I don't think you should attach undue importance to the idea of elections either, because one of the things I was trying to suggest to you was that by the mid-1970s, Politics is breaking out of the institutional form in which it had been contained. And the institutional form was, on the, was political parties, right? And you remember, so these are these mass movements, so the whole mass movement which led eventually to uh, the declaration of emergency by Indira Gandhi because she felt that there was a, some kind of threat. And of course, in part, she used a pretext of external threats in order to be able to promulgate that emergency, right? But I'm suggesting to you that when you start looking at mass-based movements, it's quite clear that in some ways we have moved out of the institutional constraint of the political party, right? And in some ways people vote with their feet, if I may put it this way, right? When you flee from one area to another or when you abandon one area, what are you doing? You're, you're voting with your feet, right? So I think that there are different ways to look at this idea of what constitutes political action, and what I was trying to suggest to you was that the idea of citizenship has to be taken in a slightly bro broader context, not simply be viewed simply as a matter of uh, you know, the, the entitlement to vote. Uh, one of the things that we had looked at was, for example, very briefly, we will touch upon this again later on, and that is the issue of reservations, right? We had actually spoken about it at some length, because here the question was, well, what do you do when, in fact, a large percentage of the country, right, uh, is in principle entitled to reservations? Right? the advantages of reservations because they are deprived for one reason or the other. They're deprived either because they belong to the Dalits or they belong to the other backward classes uh, or they're women, right? or they're in some ways living at the margins. Right? And we saw that that would mean a very substantial portion of the population of India, by far the majority population. And so the last thing that we had really looked at in relation to all of this was the whole question of majorities and minorities, you know, that should we be using that vocabulary at all? How sensible is it to use that vocabulary in some ways, okay? Um, so that's kind of a summary of what we had done, and I want you to keep, I want you to keep all of that in mind when we look at the scenario that I have drawn here on the board, some of which I've spoken about. I want to bring it together before we move to the next segment, and, and that next segment has to do with the relationship between various religious uh, constituency, constituencies and communities in India uh, in the post-1947 period. All right, so if you look at this, uh, uh, you know, rough map of India that I've drawn once again, um, I could have placed arrows here, and if we had placed the arrows, I've placed one over here, what we're, what we're seeing here is that there is, in, in some ways, uh, pressure being applied upon the center from different parts of the country, okay? Right? That, and the center here physically, you could say, is Delhi. That is, that it's the capital. But of course, by center here, I don't mean a physical spot. What I mean here is the idea of unity. There was always this question of, you know, I mean, some people raise this scenario of India disintegrating. That's a scenario that was raised constantly. Um, I don't think it was ever really a, a question that there would be any possibility of disintegration. But th the question nonetheless is, what kind of pressures were being placed upon the country, right? Uh, so if you look at this, for example, here, Bangladesh, 1971, what am I referring to over here? And, and obviously, this cannot be understood uh, outside the question of India's relationships with Pakistan, because recall what I've mentioned to you on previous occasions, that Pakistan, uh, this is West Pakistan, this used to be East Pakistan before it became Bangladesh, right? Uh, how did it become Bangladesh? So 
you have a conflict going on between Pakistan and India. Uh, the conflict emerges, as was mentioned in week one, right at the outset of independence, right? It emerges right at the outset of, of independence. In part, the conflict is obviously over the state of Kashmir, right, to the north of Delhi. Now, in, there is a stalemate to that particular conflict in 1947-48, uh, and the stalemate occurs partly because eventually India decided uh, Jawaharlal Nehru decided to go to the United Nations and see if the United Nations would issue a call for a ceasefire, which is exactly what happened. A call for a ceasefire was issued. Um, and uh, at that point, you enter into the stalemate, okay, or the status quo. Right? Now, the conflict was, of course, not resolved. And so India and Pakistan have hostile relationships to each other. Remember that in the meantime, the Cold War has already started. Right? And you might also recall what I mentioned to you, that India was in the forefront of what was called a non-aligned movement. Right, The idea was that India would align itself neither with the Soviet bloc nor with the U.S. slash NATO bloc. Uh, the U.S. is meanwhile getting assistance from the United States, Okay, substantial assistance. Uh, and if you keep up with the news today, uh, today meaning these, you know, in our times, uh, you know that, in fact, the U.S. is still the largest backer of Pakistan. Even while the U.S. is expressing reservations about what is really going on in Pakistan, you know, they're really worried about whether the Pakistani army and the Pakistani state has a grip on the situation over there. But at the same time, it's very clear that the U.S. will continue to dole out money. It certainly has been doing that for the last six decades to Pakistan, right? Now, in 1965, you have a war that breaks out between India and Pakistan, uh, which is in the desert, essentially. Okay, it's in the desert, uh, in the Ran of Kutch, that area over there, which is in Rajasthan, uh, so close to the borders. Um, and uh, again, if you read the Pakistani version of it, I think that the interpretation is quite different, because in Pakistan, this is not depicted as a defeat of Pakistan. Um, in India, obviously, it is depicted as a complete triumph of Indian arms over Pakistan. So, you know, you can, you're going to get two different views of this, and then what you can obviously do is you can go to some purportedly neutral source. I'm not quite sure what the neutral source here would be, but you can go to outside sources to try to determine what exactly happened. I wouldn't describe this as a huge conflict. I mean, it lasts over a period of, you know, a few weeks. Um, and I think that it would be safe to say from my standpoint, from my assessment of the literature, that India probably had the upper hand in this conflict, partly because India was militarily superior uh, to Pakistan. Um, and I think that that continues to be the case down to the present day. Okay, and this is going to have some bearing um, uh, for our uh, consideration about uh, the fact that both of these countries are now nuclear powers, but we're going to get to that later on, okay, because that's a much later development. So this is what happens in 1965, um, and then in 19, the late 1960s, uh, uh, 1970, uh, a situation again arises where it is very clear that some kind of conflict might occur between India and Pakistan. What is the occasion for that conflict? That's what we want to look at very briefly, because this is, this is how we're going to be able to understand what is the bearing upon all of these different elements, right? And we're going to go over all of them very briefly uh, in trying to understand what were the pressures being placed upon the center. That is, that what were the possibilities of disintegration? What were the kinds of political conflicts that that India had to really think about in this period from the 1960s to the 1980s, all right? So what is happening here that leads to, in fact, the breakup of Pakistan, uh, su such that East Pakistan is going to become an independent state in 1971? Now, the first thing to bear in mind is that you have this extraordinary anomaly. I've pointed to this before, and again, now it's worthwhile pondering over this, which is that you have a state which is essentially in two portions. So you have one portion of the state of Pakistan on the west, and then you have one portion over here divided by over a thousand miles of Indian territory, well over a thousand miles of Indian territory. Okay? The predominant language in East Pakistan is Bengali. I should say was Bengali because, of course, it's still Bengali, but it's not East Pakistan anymore. Right? So the predominant language, we were looking at what led to the conflict, was Bengali. The pre in, in, the West, in West Pakistan, you had a number of languages, uh, but the predominant language and the language of the state, you could say, was Urdu. Okay? Urdu. Right? Now, 
If you look at the population of Pakistan, it is very clear that even though, by the way, West Pakistan was physically larger than East Pakistan, substantially larger than East Pakistan, the population density in East Pakistan was much greater, much greater than it was in West Pakistan. And because the federal bureaucratic structure and the military were all based in West Pakistan. So West Pakistan is, if I may put it this way, the administrative. Uh, you know, the capital is, is Islamabad, which is in West Pakistan, right? So in other words, this, the government is centered over there. This is the access of power. This is where power is being exercised in every sense of the term, okay? Except in one domain, which is in economics. That is that, where are the revenues of the state coming from? Okay, are the revenues of the state coming only from farming in manufacturing in West Pakistan? Are they also coming from East Pakistan? In fact, we know that, for example, um, after partition, one of the things that East Pakistan got was jute industries, okay, which was a major source of revenue, right? Okay, so if you're looking at the distribution of revenue, and then if you're looking at the allocation of resources, allocation of resources here meaning, all right, so what percentage of the total revenues of the state, in fact, actually go, okay, in the allocation of the budget, go to East Pakistan, what percentage go to West Pakistan? And what we're going to find here is there's a lopsided distribution. West Pakistan is, in fact, actually getting the bulk of the resources. This is where the money of the state is going for development. So, of course, the Bengali-speaking Muslims of East Pakistan felt that there was acute discrimination against them, okay? They're not getting enough resources from the state. Uh, Bengali has a second-class status in Pakistan, even though numerically the number of speakers of Bengali is much greater than the number of speakers of Urdu, okay? Which was a language, predominant language over there. Urdu was hardly known to the Bengali Muslims. You could also say that there are other kinds of cultural complexities, such as the fact that the Bengali Muslims over here were much more closely intertwined with Bengali Hindus. Okay? This, was, this was a culture that had developed a distinct ethos of its own for, in various ways. Right? So what we're saying, in effect, I mean, I'm giving you the capsule account of it, you know, a very, very condensed account of it is that you have two different portions of this country, okay? Uh, one is predominantly Bengali speaking, almost entirely Bengali speaking. The other, the main language is Urdu, although it's not, it's not the only language. You have Sindhi, you have Punjabi, so forth and so on, right? And because Pakistan, West Pakistan was actually divided into several different areas, right? We're saying that Economically, it's very clear that East Pakistan is being, in fact, actually strapped for resources, right? It's not getting the, it's not getting its proportionate due of resources, right? Uh, and in effect, East Pakistanis, which, who are Bengalis, basically feel that they have a second class status in their own country, okay? That's the situation that we're talking about. Now, there is an electoral situation that's going to develop. The electoral situation is going to be that when the elections are going to take place uh, uh, in 1971, okay, the, the leader of a party called the Awami League, okay, so this is, a, this is a party called the Awami League, and you have to remember that elections that take place are for elections to the assembly of the entire country. Right? So the National Assembly is sitting in West Pakistan, because remember that this is where the government... I'm terribly sorry, I was being very quick. I just forgot it. Okay. All right. So what we're saying is that if you look at the situation in West Pakistan, okay, this is where the assembly is located. This is where the parliament is located. So when you have elections, you have candidates who are competing from East Pakistan as well. Now, in the elections that are going to take place in 1971, the Awami League, which is a party which represents the interests of East Pakistani Bengali Muslims, okay, is going to become the dominant party, which, of course, is going to upset the elites in West Pakistan because now what you're going to have is you're going to have a Bengali Muslim, okay, coming from East Pakistan, who is now going to become the prime minister of both parts of the country, right? 
This is the scenario that we're talking about. This is a scenario that was obviously not attractive to the elites in West Pakistan. So a political crisis is basically developing in that part of the country. And there are going to be several different consequences. The biggest consequence is repression of Bengali Muslims by the West Pakistani military elite. Okay, so impo imposition of a military dictatorship, which is going to take place in 1971. And one of the consequences of that repression, of that political repression, is you're going to have people moving from East Pakistan into India now. Okay, because what they're doing is they're fleeing the persecution now. They're fleeing the persecution. By August of 1971, India has close to 10 million refugees who have come from Bangladesh. It's not called Bangladesh at that point. It's still East Pakistan. Okay? They have moved into India. In fact, I recall when I was growing up, they issued a, a separate refugee stamp. Okay? You know, the idea was to generate rev revenue. You know, okay? um, and these people are coming into India. It's not as though there aren't enough people in India already, if I may put it this way. Okay? Particularly in that part of the country. I mean, this is a highly densely populated part of the country. Right? Now you've got refugees coming in. Right? And obviously, it's an enormous drain of resources on India. Right? So this is going to obviously push India into the conflict. Now, this is not to say that India was not interested in what was happening. I mean, of course, the Pakistani view of the matter is that India was looking for an opportunity for Pakistan to break up. Right? Because the decimation of Pakistan obviously means, from the standpoint of India, this is the Pakistani version, the elimination of Pakistan is a real threat, right? Okay, because it means obviously that the country is no longer in a situation to be able to offer combat to India, right? Uh, the vivisection of, or the division of Pakistan, is from the standpoint of the Pakistani elite an outlook that India greatly desired. Now India had a pretext to move into the conflict. What is a pre pretext that essentially this internal conflict between East Pakistan and West Pakistan is in fact now doing what? It's basically bearing down upon us. It's making things difficult for India. Okay? And so this is a scenario that we're talking about. I can't take you through all the minor details or even some of the major details of how this conflict is going to eventually mushroom into a full-scale war, but that's eventually what's going to happen in early December 1971, it's, there's going to be a war that's going to break out between Pakistan and India. And here, by the way, I don't think it's possible to fudge the issue and say, well, we're not sure whether there was a stalemate or what. I mean, here there's no question whatsoever what really happens. Namely, you're talking about a decisive military triumph for India, right? Because what's going to happen? The West Pakistani army is going to have to surrender to the Indian army on the eastern frontier, and when, in fact, they surrender, what it means is that East Pakistan has now broken away and has eventually become a separate state, right? And that separate state is obviously then going to be called Bangladesh, right? So this is a conflict we're speaking about. Now, let's keep that conflict aside for a moment because obviously there's a great deal to be said. For example, what were the relations that took place between India and Bangladesh? You would think that relations between India and Bangladesh were really, really friendly because Bangladesh was going to be eternally grateful to India because India had been a great force in the emancipation of these people, right? Well, relations are not going to be all that friendly necessarily all the time, right? But we're going to leave that aside for the time being because what we're really doing is, is we're looking at the situation from the 1960s to the 1980s and trying to understand what were the different kinds of constraints upon the Indian state, right? So this is one constraint in the South you have a different set of circumstances. What you have is a anti-North Indian, anti-Brahminical movement. It's called the Dravida movement. Okay, uh, uh, you know, related to the word Dravidian because recall what I've mentioned to you on a number of occasions. The languages spoken in North India are what are called Indo-European or Indo-Aryan languages. The languages spoken in the South, right? The four major languages, okay, uh, Tamil, uh, Kannada, Malayalam, Telugu, right? These are Dravidian languages, right? They're, they're, it's a different family of languages, okay? Different people, different history. And of course, that doesn't mean that there has been no connection between the North and the South. 
We know that they are, they are Indian gods such as Shiva, Vishnu, and so on, who are pan-Indian gods. They're worshipped in the south, they're worshipped in the north. The modes of worship might vary, right? And we know that if you look at Tamil, which is the major language of South India, the one certainly with the oldest history, I should say, we know that there have been a large number of loan words from Sanskrit, from North India into Tamil as well. Right? And one could give, obviously, hundreds of illustrations of this kind, of the integration of South India and North India, right? But nonetheless, these two parts of the countries also had different trajectories. Now, one of the sources of anguish in South India was the imposition or the perceived imposition of North Indian rule, if I may put it this way, upon people living in South India. And this is very often, by the way, sometimes captured in, uh, uh, in, in different slogans. One slogan that you might want to think about is Hindi, Hindu, Hindu, Hindustan. Okay, this is a slogan that used to be uh, that used to be heard quite frequently. It's still heard every now and then. Uh, what does this mean? That that if you're looking, of course, this is also a slogan that sometimes was was used by other groups as well. But basically, what we're speaking about here is Hindi, which is a predominant language of North India, right? Uh, and you recall what I mentioned to you on a previous occasion that Hindi was going to become compulsory throughout India. Okay in the beginning in the 1950s, right? Because the idea was what kind of link language are you going to have? What kind of language are you going to have that's going to link the entire country? Some people said, well, we already have English. But the problem here was that English was a language of the elites. It's not an Indian language, right? So what is going to be the, what is going to be the link language for the entire country? Hindi. And Hindi comes in not only through schooling, it also comes in through things like Bollywood, okay? Through Hindi films. Right? So you've got Hindi films that are being screened in the South, right? And some people said, well, you could see the discrepancy between the North and the South because you did not really have South Indian films being screened in the North, which, strictly speaking, is actually inaccurate. You did have South Indian films, films made in Tamil, Malayalam, and so forth and so on, being screened in the North, except that I think it would be safe to say that they didn't have the same kind of currency. Okay, they were not as widely viewed back in the north as Hindi films were in the south itself, okay? But the south has a very, very major, you know, cinema of its own. I mean, so it doesn't have to rely upon the north for its entertainment, right? In fact, we know that the films made in Malayalam, Telugu, Tamil, Kannada together are greater than the number of films made in Hindi itself, greater than Bollywood, in fact, right? Okay, but the point here is what you have here is a anti-North Indian movement so you can call it a Dravida movement. It's also anti-Brahminical. It's anti-upper caste. Because the, if you look, which is not to say, by the way, that there are no Brahmins in the South. There are Brahmins in the South, but the idea here was that Brahminical culture had been far more decisive in shaping the course of Indian politics in the North, and that this culture was now being pushed down into the South, if I may put it this way. Okay. Right? So this is a Dravida movement, and you might say, well, what did it really amount to? What it amounted to was large demonstrations that took place, for example, in Tamil Nadu against the imposition of Hindi. Large, very large demonstrations, which would sometimes, in fact, actually paralyze the government. Okay? Right? So, of course, the question here was, what is this thing called India? What is the unity of India? when you have these kinds of insurrections taking place all the time, this kind of unrest taking place, right? So this is what's happening from this part of the country. You've got this conflict here, uh, which is eventually going to lead to the creation of Bangladesh. In the south, you have the anti-Dravida movement. In the west, you have what might be described as Marathi chauvinism, okay? So this is the chauvinism of people who were Marastrians, uh, who were basically trying to argue that you know, the influence of Gujaratis is too predominant in places like Bombay, okay? Right, and this is, gets into, you know, various kinds of specialties, if I may put it this way, about Indian history that I think it's going to be difficult to venture into in a class of this kind. Uh, but what you, might, what you might want to understand this as is that what you have here, again, is the assertion of a regional identity. Okay? That's the easiest way to understand it. The assertion that while at the same time there is obviously pressure to think of yourself as an Indian, 
lots of people in the country are also thinking about the assertions of what you might call regional identity. Okay, so in, in the West here, you have the assertion of a certain kind of Marathi regional identity. What are its consequences? Let me give you one illustration. That in the metropolis of Bombay, which was then certainly the preeminent city of India, whether it is still the preeminent city of India or not is a matter that one can discuss. I mean, some people would say that, well, there are three or four cities, you know, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, they're all, you know, equally large, equally, metro, equally cosmopolitan, so forth and so on. But certainly, I think if you're looking at the 1950s, there's no question that Bombay, which is what it was then called, was a preeminent city, okay? Uh, with the possible exception of Calcutta in the east here, okay? Now, what, what does this Marathi chauvinism amount to? What it amounts to is the assertion of Marathi supremacy in the city of Bombay so that the Gujarati presence, for example, there is a demand that Gujarati presence in Bombay should be reduced, right? That jobs should be reserved exclusively for people who are speakers of Marathi, right? And why Marathi? Because we know that Bombay is eventually going to become the capital of the state called Maharashtra, right? So you have a state called Gujarat and then you have a state called Maharashtra. Right, so the demand is that, and Bombay is going to become the capital of Maharashtra, as I said, so the demand is that in the state of Maharashtra, right, the, pre, the jobs should be reserved largely for people who are, in fact, Marathi. And, in fact, it is not only the Gujaratis who are viewed by the Marathis as a threat, because the largest number of administrative jobs was actually in the city of Bombay, was held not by Marathis, but by South Indians, people from South India. Right? So Marathi chauvinism is something that rises to the fore in the 1950s and in fact is a problem down to the present day. Right? I mean last year in India alone uh, a party called the Shiv Sena, okay, which is a political party that really has a constituency only in that part of the country. Okay? So last year, the Shiv Sena, in fact, actually conducted a campaign uh, where they said that people who were coming from North India, from places like UP, for example, right, that these are people who, you know, would be forcibly ejected from the city if they tried to take jobs that they thought ought to go only to Marathi speakers. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say Marathi chauvinism. Okay, then we have the problem of Punjab, which is a problem that is going to be of acute proportions, we're going to have to spend a considerable amount of time, but I want to save that for a future lecture because, as I said, that's something that we're going to have to look at in much, much greater detail. And finally, let's move to this part of the picture over here, right? Uh, in 1962, India and China are going to go to war, okay? Now, here again, we need to pause and think a little bit about what is really going on. How is it that India gets into a war with China in 1962? By the way, this is, if I may put it this way, a forgotten war. I mean, virtually nobody knows anything about it. I mean, except for a few scholars who have worked here and there, and obviously people who keep abreast of what's happening. Um, but I mean, if you ask most people mm, uh, about the war between India and China in 1962, you get a blank stare. Um, and, and, and it may be possible to argue that the word war is uh, a kind of a lofty word for what happened here in 1962. What's going to happen is you're going to have Chinese troops which are going to come into India, okay? into Arunachal Pradesh, uh, which is a contested territory from the point of view of China. Of course, I wonder what kind of territory is not contested from the point of view of China sometimes. Um, but uh, that is certainly the case, that they contested the borders between India and China. Uh, and you're going to have these troops coming into Arunachal with Pradesh, which is a state within India, within Northeast. And he here, here refers to Northeast India. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, this thing is going to last for a few weeks. I mean, they get quite deep into Indian territory, and then they suddenly retreat. Okay? They suddenly retreat and move back. I mean, the idea was almost like, like a blitzkrieg. It's like a lightning strike. The idea is, okay, let's just show the Indians what we can do, right? You can, we can pounce upon them, you know, surprise them, take over some territory. But we're not really going to take it over because we are not an imperialist nation. Right? I mean, we're not really an aggrandizing nation, uh, uh, and so we just want to be able to really show India what kind of cards we can play. I mean, this is one way to look at what happened. But before we really look at 1962, we have to say, well, how did things come to that state? 
Okay? And it's rather surprising, you might say, that things came to that state. Because after 1947, after India became free, I think it would be safe to say that India was probably one of the closest champions of the rights of the People's Republic of China, the PRC. Okay? So when, for example, there was, I don't know how many of you know the history of the United Nations and you know uh, the history of the Security Council, uh, but the legend has it, I say legend because I've never been actually able to confirm that through either official records um, or through biographies of Nehru, although I've seen it mentioned in many places, um, that after 1945, um, it, it is said that uh, uh, there was a decision made uh, by the great powers, which in this case means the Soviet Union, the United States, Britain, and France, right? The, there was a decision made that they were actually going to offer a, a permanent seat in the Security Council to India. Uh, I, I personally think that this is wishful thinking on the part of Indians, that they think that they got an offer of this kind, uh, because as I said, I've never really seen any evidence of that whatsoever, uh, but I've seen it mentioned. And that India and its genero generosity said, according to this story, that, well, this seat should really be given to China, okay, because China and India are really sister civilizations. These are the two oldest continuous civilizations, and yes, it is fair and proper that one of these great countries should get a permanent seat, both of them being in Asia, at least Asia will have some permanent representation in the Security Council, but that Jawaharlal Nehru said, let's offer the seat to China, uh, and China decided to accept it. That's one version of the story, okay? Uh, we don't need to get into details. What's interesting about the story, and I think that this argument can be verified, is it indicates that relationships between India and China, what I would say, pretty good, okay? And in fact, the slogan that used to be uttered all the time was Hindi, Chin, Bhai, Bhai. Bhai, Bhai means brother, brother, brother really relationship. They have a brotherly relationship. And as I've written somewhere, within 10 years from the time that the slogan was occurred, it became Hindi, Chin, Bye, Bye. Not Bye, Bye. Bye bye, you know, you just, let's just say bye bye to each other and just move on in our own separate directions. Right? They really drift off into different spheres. It's quite clear. Right? And how did this happen? Well, I think in part it has to do with the geopolitical politics, with the geopolitics of that time. It has to do with the fact that I think that India didn't quite understand what were the ambitions of China. Uh, I think it's very clear that there were these kinds of border disputes which China didn't really explicitly mention, but which were in the back of its mind, right? And I have to say, by the way, that one of the problems with trying to unravel all of these things is that these maps that were drawn, okay? Because when you get a border, the question is, how was a border decided? How was a border between India and China decided here in 1962? Who do you think decided it? Was it India? Was it China? And the answer, of course, is neither of the two, right? Because what you have is you have great European powers who are highly influential, right, in the 19th century. They are the ones who really have determined what the boundary is going to be between India and China, right? And some of this is still hard to decipher because some of these maps are top secret. You know, I mean, the, the most uh, uh, desirable volume of maps is a volume of which there are only two copies in the world and the Indian government simply won't release them, right? Okay, so this is the sort of thing that we're talking about where we're saying that we don't exactly know what the nature of these border disputes were. We know that there were claims made on both sides. Um, what we're trying to understand here is that here you have two countries. Both of these are ancient civilizations, both of them in Asia which had a very long period of contact with each other. Right? We know that Buddhism came to China from India. Okay? Um, we know that, in fact, there were Indian mathematicians and astronomers who had spent considerable amount of time in China in remote antiquity. Right? We know all of these things, which suggests that there were rather close kinds of cultural relationships between the two countries. Right? And we know that after 1947, from that period until the next decade, until the mid-1950s, India and China developed a very close relationship once again, which was embodied in what was called the Panchil principles. So Panchil here means the five path, okay? And so, you know, the five paths have to do with greater prosperity, greater economic 
connections between the two, greater cultural ties, so forth and so on. But that was a word that was used at that time, invented at that time, to suggest what would be the nature of the relations between the two countries. And we also know that few years after the formulation of the punch shield principles, which were principles which were supposed to bring China and India into close friendship, that these two countries, in fact, actually went into a situation where they were now in conflict with each other. Right. So this is basically what is transpiring. Just look at the map and ponder over it for a second. Right. What we're saying here is that from the 60s through the 1970s all the way until the early 1980s, there is considerable pressure being placed upon the idea of Indian unity. Okay? And we haven't mentioned two other elements. The second element is what's going to be the source of the topic of the main lecture for the rest of today and, and on Thursday, and that is the subject of Hindu-Muslim relationships and relationships between Hindus and other communities as well. So I'll get to that in a moment. But that other element is the Naxalites or the Naxals. Who are these people? They are mentioned in some of the readings that you have. I think it's going to be important to talk about them. Uh, uh, I also want to tell you that Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, about a year ago, described the Naxalites as the greatest threat to India. Okay, So that's a year ago. But the Naxalites, or the Naxals as they're called for short, same group of people, no difference here. Okay, The history of this goes back to the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s. So who are the Naxals? The Communist Party of India, and you remember what I mentioned to you, right? That the Communist Party of India is a official legal party with representation in the Indian parliament, right? Because they had actually won, for example, an election here. You, you might remember an election in the state of Kerala where they had been responsible for sweeping land reforms. They also one elections in the state of West Bengal over here, okay, which is where the refugees are fleeing into in part. They're also coming into other parts of North India from Bangladesh, but West Bengal is one of the places where they're coming into, right, okay. And so uh, the Communist Party of India was essentially in a dilemma in the mid 1960s. What is the dilemma? The dilemma is that there is a schism in world communism. The schism has to do with the fact that the two major communist parties of the world, which was the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China, right, led by Mao Zedong, okay, and the leadership response, you know, the other leadership there. And the other major communist party is obviously the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Now, these two communist parties, although they might be agreed about the evils of America, or the evils of capitalism, or the free market economy, whatever it is, they had a schism. They had a conflict between themselves. Okay? And the conflict has to do in part with what is the strategy that they're going to adopt for world revolution. Okay? And there are numerous grounds for schism. We don't, this is not a class on the history of communism, so we're not going to get into all the reasons for that schism. But what you have to understand, in order to understand, the emergence of the Naxalites in India is the fact that there is a conflict that takes place between the two dominant communist parties in the world. So the Indian Communist Party, when there is an official split in world communism, the Indian Communist Party, or the CPI, which is a Communist Party of India, is also going to split. It's going to split. Okay. Now, by the way, there are about 30 splinter groups. Okay, uh, I mean, trying to track down all the splinter groups of the Communist Party of India uh, is itself a Herculean task. Okay, but the major split that we are interested in is that when the Communist Party of India splits, it splits into the CPI. Okay, that's the parent party, and then the CPIML, ML in parentheses. You love these acronyms, right? By now, you should be an absolute expert on these acronyms here. So ML here is Marxist-Leninist, OK? Now, this was a bit of a mouthful. Communist Party of India, you know, you ask somebody what party you are in. So, you know, I'm CPIML. So this simply, in short, becomes CPM, which means Communist Party of India, Marxist, OK? Right? So this is a split that's going to take place. CPI, Communist Party of India, and then you have the CPM. 
the CPI follows the China path, path, if I may put it this way. And the CPM is going to follow the Soviet Union. Okay? This is the first split. There are going to be subsequent splits, lots of subsequent splits. Right? The China party, we are interested in the history of the Naxalites. Who are the Naxalites? Okay? And why is it that Manmohan Singh, in 2008, the Prime Minister of India declared the Naxalites as the greatest threat to India? Right? And where are their strengths? What is their ideology? That's what we're interested in. And that's in order to understand that, we have to basically be able to understand the history of a very short history of the Communist Party of India. Right? So you get this split. The CPI goes the China route. The CPM goes the Soviet Union route. Okay? When you go the China route, what it meant in part was a view that real revolution could not be achieved by working within the institutions of the state. So for example, the old Communist Party of India had taken a decision, which in my view is a correct decision, but it had taken a decision that it was going to actually fight the elections. Right? In other words, it's going to be another political party. It's going to take part in the electoral process. Right? That's what it means, that you are an official party, you work within the parameters of institutional politics, you accept yourself as a political party, and therefore you're subject to all of the constraints of political parties as well. Right? But you work, in short, if I may use the colloquial expression in English, you work within the system to try to change it. That was the view of the old Communist Party. The CPI, when the split takes place, essentially is going to split again. Why? Because one portion of the CPI is going to say, OK, we follow the China route, OK, and we're going to work within the system. But one portion within the CPI says, yeah, we'll follow the China route, but we are not going to work within the system. Because the only possibility of altering the feudal structures of India, that's their view. The only possibility is a real revolution from without. That is, you work outside the political structure. So now we're talking about three parties, right? We're talking about the CPI, Communist Party of India. Then we're talking about the Communist Party of India, which is going to go a different route. They both still accept the Chinese model. They still accept the Chinese model, but they say, we're going to actually not work within the system at all. Right? And this is going to be the party that today, by the way, is called the CPI Maoist. Okay? And what does that Maoist here refer to? It refers to the fact that they basically follow the teachings of Mao Zedong. Okay? At least in principle. In principle. Right? Now, what is the relationship of all of this to the Naxalites? The relationship is you have a little town here in West Bengal. It's called Naxalbari. Okay? So you can see Naxal is a common part of the... Naxalbari, this is the name of the town, right? And in, in the late 1960s, you're going to have an uprising where the CPI Maoist, okay, is going to send its cadres, as they're called, right? It's basically its followers, right? Its social workers, political workers, they're going to send them and they're going to encourage an insurrection, an uprising in the town of Naxalbari, right? What is their ideology? The ideology I've mentioned one element of the ideology, and that is that you work outside the system. You want to create a real revolution. Right? Of course, a revolution needs a vanguard, a disciplined vanguard. That's what the party seeks to provide. Right? But the party also takes the view that you cannot have a real revolution if the vanguard is all coming from outside the area. Okay? I mean, this is an interesting, complicated sort of set of views that we're looking at about what is the nature of a revolution? How do you create a revolution? So let's supposing that Harvard educated and UCLA educated you know, professors all wanted to create a revolution and you go to Fargo, North Dakota, right? But who's going to listen to these guys in Fargo, North Dakota, right? Because the view here would be ah, the only way to really achieve a revolution here is if you have organic intellectuals. That is, these are people who are coming from within the soil of that place. And the reason they're willing to fight a revolution is because they can see how their lives are being impacted. OK? Right? So what we're doing is we're adding a new element to the ideology now. That new element was 
the Naxalites, so the Naxalites are people who encourage the insurrection in Naxalbari. They become known as the Naxalites. And their view is, okay, A, there has to be a real revolution, and you have to work outside the system. B, you must have a solid base of support in the areas that you want to create a revolution. Because if you just come there from the outside, and there's no real support inside, the revolution cannot work. And then, of course, to have a real base inside there means that you must have some conception of the organic intellectual, organic activists. That is, people in that area itself who agree with the aims of the revolution. Okay? Then we get into other aspects of the ideology. What are the other aspects of their ideology? The view, for example, that you need a fundamental transformation of the social structures of India. And if you need to use violence to do that, it's perfectly acceptable. So this is, of course, a very substantial departure now from the views of Gandhi, right, who had been, in some ways, as I said, all important, at least for a period of time. Okay? So what these people are going to do is they're basically going to try to create, if I may put it this way, foment unrest. Right? And they're still active. Now, there's a lot of discussion about whether there is a kind of a Naxalite belt okay, in India. When I say a Naxalite belt or a Naxalite corridor, um, one argument that has been given, and I think in part it is probably an accurate argument, okay, but it's you know, difficult to really pinpoint whether it would work throughout. Some people have argued that the areas that are most susceptible to Naxalite influence or Naxalite ideology are the tribal areas of India. Why? Because the tribals are the people who are exploited much more so than anybody else, to the hilt. Right? And where do you find tribal groups, by the way? You find them, A, in all parts of India. Virtually every state of India has some kind of tribal population. There are some states, by the way, which have a very heavy density of tribal population. So if you look at, uh, for example, if you look at this part of the country over here, you know, so they, there's, a, there's a state, uh, there's a, uh, a state called Chhattisgarh, okay? Chhattisgarh, which is a recent state. What is a state of Chhattisgarh? It's basically a state comprised largely of tribal people. So they, it was broken away from another state. Okay, or if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the state of UP, which is over here, you look up at a map of India, and you'll see that there was a new state that was created called Uttarakhand. Okay, and Uttarakhand is the hill regions of UP. So I wouldn't say it's strictly tribal, but it's a distinction between the hill people as opposed to the people living on the plains, right? People living along the Ganges, you know, the the banks of the Ganges, you know, that whole delta over there. Okay, right. So what we're saying over here is that. According to one argument, there is an axolite corridor or belt, which means that wherever you have tribal people, okay, the Naxalite influence is going to be relatively strong. And what do the Naxalites seek to do? They seek to disrupt the normal political and economic relationships that obtain in that area. Right? So they will seek to usurp the local administration put into place their own administration. And of course, some people have argued that they have varying degrees of support. In some parts of the country, the Naxalites are much stronger than in other parts of the country. And again, we don't really know exactly how many people fall under the Naxalite corridor. The estimate is that up to 150 million people in India live in areas which are now heavily under the influence or control of the Naxalites. And if you, if you accept that figure, 150 million, we're saying well over 10% of the population of India, right? Close to 13, 14% of the population of India. That's a huge number of people, right? Who are apparently living in areas under Naxalite influence. And I'm not saying that all of them are Naxalites. So there's a big difference. I'm simply saying that these are people who are living in areas where the Naxalite activity is supposed to be at a pretty heightened level, OK? Right? So this is essentially what we're talking about. When does this problem begin? Or when do the Naxalites emerge? In the late 1960s, right? You're going to have uh, uh, the Naxalite presence is going to be pretty strong uh, for the next couple of years. Obviously, state repression, what the Indian government is going to try to do is they're going to try to repress this movement, try to put it down. 
Okay? But then it continues to resurface. Why does it continue to resurface? I think one plausible explanation, obviously, is the fact that the social inequalities in India were never eliminated. Right? Because what obviously feeds the Naxalite movement is enormous amounts of social inequality in this country. Right? Right? That's, that's what is its oxygen. Right? It needs oxygen. And this is its oxygen. The fact that you have sufficiently large number of people in the country who have legitimate reasons to feel disgruntled, to feel that they do not actually have an opportunity in life to make do, right? To improve their economic prospects, the economic prospects of their families, so forth and so on. That's what we're really talking about, OK? Any questions about this scenario that I have laid out for you about, you know, but now we're speaking about politics in a different domain, right? I mean, of course, it has a relationship to the questions of sovereignty, citizenship, all of that. But here I'm sketching out sort of a map, if I may put it this way, of the kinds of questions. And this is not meant to be exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination. There are lots of other conflicts going on, lots of other pressures, lots of other questions about the integrity and unity of India, right? But I'm giving you some, some of the more principal domains of that conflict. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to move to and I'm going to give a full lecture on this on Thursday, but I want to set it up for you. So I want to look at the nature of Hindu-Muslim relations in India. Okay, um, it will be important to speak about relationships between Muslims and Sikhs, Hindus and Sikhs, Hindus and other groups, uh, and the idea here again is not to be politically correct and say, ah, well, I have to make sure that I speak a little bit about each and every group. Uh, but in some of these cases, the questions are important. For example, there has been a whole spate of anti-Christian violence in the state of Orissa. Orissa is right here in eastern India, below Bengal. Okay? There's been anti-Christian violence in that state for the last, I would say, 10, 12 years. Okay? Uh, in the state of Karnataka, in South India, last year, Several dozen churches were burnt down. Several dozen churches were burnt down. Okay. And the people who are responsible for some of this, uh, that's a generous phrase, if I may put it this way, because the state sometimes acts as though nobody's responsible. Right? So if you actually try to figure out, has anybody been apprehended? Has anybody been caught? Has anybody been convicted? Almost never. Almost never. In India, there are almost never any criminal convictions for this kind of thing. And one reason for that is because the violence has political patrons. Political patrons. That is that somewhere in the political party, in some political party, somebody is giving a green light to these people and saying, go ahead and do it. And you can be quite sure there are going to be no consequences. Once in a while, you might get a scapegoat, right? and put that person on trial or convict somebody. But by and large, the rule of thumb in India is if you engage in this kind of violence, personally, you will have very little to fear. Very little to fear. The chances that you're going to be apprehended, that there are going to be consequences, I think are very minimal. And I think that this is an enormous blot on Indian democracy, but it's also a blot on the very concept of what constitutes human dignity, right, at all, to begin with, right? So this is why it's important to think that the relationships that we are speaking about are not simply relationships between Hindus and Muslims. If I'm going to spend so much time on that, it's obviously because this is the paradigmatic relationship, right? It is the central relationship here that we're looking at. We're looking at, obviously, the two largest religious communities in India, right? And in the case of this anti-Christian violence, I also have to say that the argument on the other side is that this violence would never have taken place had it not been for aggressive attempts at proselytization in these areas. Okay. Now we can sit down and we can try to discuss whether, in fact, there is, a, you know, whether this argument is sustainable or not. And when I say aggressive proselytization, in plain English, what that means is there are people who are arguing that Christian evangelical groups have moved into these areas with their missionaries, and they are trying to 
in fact, influence the local people to convert to Christianity. Okay? And there is resentment in some of the local population for that. And the people who are making that argument will also point out, I think this second part of the argument is correct. Because historically speaking, that is correct. Namely, that proselytization is something that does not, historically speaking, take place within Hinduism. Right? So they're saying that, look, there's, the scales are unevenly tipped. Right? Because this is the nature of Christianity, and this is the nature of Islam. But here we are speaking about Christianity. Right? From their point of view, this is, that is, if you're looking at Orissa, the anti-Christian violence here, the anti-Christian violence in the state of Karnataka, they're saying that the nature of Christianity is to constantly find new converts. Proselytization is central to the history of Christianity. Right? And they're saying that these conversions are not simple, innocuous conversions, that somebody is converting to Christianity because that person is a lower caste person who is miserable within his own faith. They're saying there are always certain kinds of economic inducements. So for example, you offer economic rewards to people who are going to convert. Right? And so they, this is the argument that's coming from that side. And if we were really looking at this argument in great detail, then I think we would have to begin to parse some of these elements and see, well, which element of this narrative can be sustained and which is problematic, right? But I'm simply giving you some sense of the kinds of questions that are involved here and also trying to suggest to you that I do not wish to minimize the problems that may be occurring between other kinds of religious communities, right? But we want to really look at Hindu-Muslim relations, okay? Before we do that, let us begin with a fundamental question, and that is the question of identity, okay? Right? Because when we say that there is a Hindu-Muslim conflict, we have decided what constitutes Hindu identity and what constitutes Muslim identity. Right? And of course, I think that all of you will agree on reflection that when we say Hindu-Muslim conflict, by no stretch of the imagination should that be interpreted to mean that all Hindus think alike or that all Muslims think alike, whatever this category called Hindus may be and whatever this category called Muslims may be. Okay? So I think that before we get to this question of what is called communalis, communalism, uh, right? this is a word that is used in India. And if you are studying contemporary India, this is one word you should become absolutely intimately familiar with, communalism. And communalism, let me hasten to add, has nothing to do with living in communes. We're not talking about hippies here and flower children and all of that. Okay, it has absolutely nothing to do with the word commune in the English language as it is used in the United States, for example. Okay, communalism here simply means, and then we'll have to go back to the question of identity because when we say simply, it is not, there's nothing simple about this, unfortunately. But what communalism means is, a, like, as in, for example, the phrase, a communal conflict. It means a conflict between people who identify themselves as members of a religious community, right? So communal conflict, if you had to render it into yet another phrase, you could say religion-based conflict. That's what it means in the Indian context, okay? Uh, you are beginning at a very elementary definition of it because we'll have to move to more complex definitions of what constitutes communalism, okay? Because for example, let's say I'm a Hindu, so does that mean that I partake of Hindu identity in every sense of the term, right? And then we'll have to say, well, who decides what is Hindu identity to begin with, okay? So before we can decide what constitutes, let's say, Hindu identity, right? Let's first talk about identity, right? And here I want a real dialogue, if I may put it this way, because I want to understand, I want to know what you understand by the concept of identity. Right? So, you know, if, if somebody said, what is your identity, what would you say? Anybody? What do you understand by identity? 
Okay, well, you start with the country you're born. So let's supposing you're born, let's take an example, Fiji. Okay? And you'll see why I've taken this example in just a moment. Okay, so identity has to do with the country where you're born. Okay? Uh, and, and if somebody said, what is your identity, Natalia, what would you say? Um, Brazilian. Brazilian. Okay. So, so in other words, now we're saying identity has something to do with national identity. Right? You, you noticed how we moved quickly from identity to national identity, which means national origins. National origin. So let's supposing we take somebody who comes from Fiji. For example, there is a very large number of Indians who have been living in Fiji for the last 125 years. In fact, until 20 years ago, you would be surprised to know that the predominant population of Fiji, which is not an Indian island, in fact, it's thousands of miles away from India, the predominant population until 20 years ago was Indian. 60% of the population of Fiji was Indian. 35% was Melanesian or ethnic Fijian. That is people who are indigenous to that area. And they became a minority. We won't worry about how they became a minority. Okay? Right? But they did. This is 20 years ago. Now the number of Indians has gone down because there have been three military coups in Fiji and there's been an exodus of Indians. So the Indian population is now down to about 42 to 44 percent. Okay? All right? And there are Indo-Fijians. There are Indo-Fijians, that is, Fijians of Indian origin. Right, because remember there was, uh, Natalia had said or somebody had said about origins, right, where you come from. So they're Indo-Fijians, right, who have never been to India. Because four generations ago, their parents came to Fiji, and most of these Indians who are now in Fiji have never seen India at all. Right? If, if you call them Fijians, the ethnic Fijians, will take up arms. Because the, as far as the ethnic Fijians are concerned, the only people who should be called Fijians are the Melanesians or ethnic Fijians. Right? Everybody else is Indo-Fijian or Chinese, Chinese Fijian, whatever. You have to have the hyphenated term there. Now, as I said in the last 20 years, these Indo-Fijians have diminished in numbers. And they started going to countries such as the United States, New Zealand, Australia. New Zealand and Australia because they're relatively close to Fiji. Relatively close and they're also part of the affluent industrialized world. Okay? So they started going to these places. The ones who went to Australia, some of them really wanted to come to the U.S. But there's a complicated travel migration pattern because it has to do with who you are, what qualifications you have, can you come in or not. But the long and short of it is that you have Indo-Fijians who went to Australia or New Zealand and some of them have now moved to the United States, which is what they consider their home. Okay? So who are these people? How would you characterize them? Are they Indians? Are they Fijians? Are they Australians? Or are they Americans? What are they? Right? Because if you, for example, asked one of these people, what do you identify with most closely? A lot of them who have never been to India. And in fact, when they were driven out of Fiji, they did not think of going to India. That was the last place they wanted to go to. Okay? They wanted to go to Australia or preferably the United States. But if you ask them, what are you and what is your closest identification? Without any hesitation, the majority of them will say Indian. But they don't want to live there. Right? That's, that reminds me of lots of Indians here too, by the way. But we'll, that's another interesting subject for another time. OK? Right? So we have a little problem here. Because when you say, who are you? And you say, oh, I'm so and so. And that means, in effect, where you're from. So somebody says, where am I from? Well, I know where I'm from, but 
where I'm from itself is a complicated phrase in my view in the English language because where I'm from is not simply a reference to where I was born, but where have I come from, right? Where are you from? So if I, if I go to Fiji and somebody says, where are you from? Well, I've lived in the United States for 25 years, okay? Um, but I don't carry an American passport, for example, right? But I've lived here for 25 years. So where am I from? Am I from India? Am I from the US, right? Slight complication if you ask me, okay? And you can, you'll see why I'm complicating it here, because what we're trying to understand is something as, as fundamental as this concept of identity, right? But so far, we have only stuck to one thing, and that is the concept of national origins, national origins, right? Because I think if you asked, what is a person's identity, it has to do with a whole range of other things. It has to do with gender. It has to do with class. It may have to do with the language you speak, right? All of these things. And all of these things are what I am going to call, if I may put it this way, and there's a slight modification that you can insert if you want to, but I'm going to call them biological vectors, biological vectors. Because the language you speak, by and large, is going to be determined. By and large, there are going to be exceptions, always. And there are going to be exceptions, clearly, in the case of immigrants as well, OK? But by and large, the language you speak is going to be the language that you inherit from your mother or from your parents, okay? So-called mother tongue, okay? And yet I want to suggest to you that there is a fundamental problem in viewing identity in this way, right? And I'll give you this illustration of what I mean. So this is a purely hypothetical illustration because it's never occurred this way, but for the sake of argument, it will work. Let's supposing we locked up Vinay Lal in a room with 10 NBA players, okay? 10 basketball players. <laughs> OK? Then at that point, I can tell you that what I'm going to be thinking about most of all with respect to my identity is the fact that I'm short and there are all these people who are gigantic in that room with me. OK? In other words, who am I at that point? Well, what I am is somebody who's relatively short. This is the most impressive thing that occurs to me at that point in time. Now let's shift the register a bit. Let's supposing the next day I get locked up with 20 women in a room and I'm the only male. Okay? Now I think at that point what I'm going to be thinking about, I may be thinking about a few other things too, but we won't worry about that. What I'm going to be thinking about is, ah, most of all I am a male. Because that's the aspect of my identity that is most evident to me at that juncture, at that juncture, OK? And let's supposing a week later, Vidalao gets locked up in a room with 20 males, and it so transpires over conversation, and only conversation, I hope, that I am the only straight fellow in that room, <laughs> right? They're all gay. I'm the only person who's straight, as they say. OK, now we have, now where am I? Now my identity has n really, if I, if I may put it to you this way, the fact that I'm an Indian couldn't really matter at that point, does it? Frankly, it doesn't, right? <laughs> the fact that I'm a socialist doesn't matter either at that point. Absolutely inconsequential, if you ask me. I mean, it may be that if we had time for a leisurely 10-hour conversation, that it may be that five of those people are socialists too. So maybe it may matter in the long run. But at that immediate moment, the part of my identity that is going to matter the most is the fact that I am a heterosexual, and they're not. OK? And then we can, of course, shift this scenario. Next day, I get locked up in a room with 20 people, all of whom are members of the National Rifle Association, and I'm not, right? Then it's not really going to matter even whether I'm Indian or even heterosexual or homosexual or this or that. What's going to matter is the fact that ideologically, they are poles apart from me, right? In some sense or the other. It may be that they share something ideologically with me, Again, we might find that out over a long extended conversation. You see what I'm driving at. What I'm driving at is this, that I think we cannot begin to unravel the conflict 
that is called the com communal conflict between Hindus and Muslims until we unravel the problems of identity. Because identity, unlike I think what we have been taught to believe, is a constantly shifting register, constantly shifting. Who you are is a relational concept. It has to do with who your interlocutors are, who you're dealing with, what kind of community you're placed in, as a matter of contingency. And as a matter of contingency, things are going to change constantly. Right? And somebody might say, well, that can't really be so, because there are some things that are foundational. The fact that I'm a male, that cannot change. But I'm suggesting to you that that's an inference on our part, because that may not be an important element of the identity in certain kinds of encounters. Yes? It could be, but that could change. Today, today I'm, you know, there's a, there's a guy called David Horowitz, okay, who's a person who used to be, he's a syndicated columnist for the LA Times. And in the 1960s, David Horowitz used to be a ferocious opponent of the Vietnam War, left-wing ideology, as he saw it. Overnight, he changed. Overnight. Two days later, he became a rabid supporter of the Vietnam War. So who he is with changed completely. His constituencies, his friends, all of that changed. Right? Even that is shifting. I'm simply trying to suggest to you that when we say what is important to identity is, oh, things like race, nationality, biology, right? I think let's pause and reflect on that. Because I'm suggesting to you, identity is relational. It's relational. It's contingent. OK? That is the critical element. Because when we say that there is a Hindu-Muslim conflict, what we have done, and we're going to look at this in much greater detail, obviously, we have decided that religion is the constitutive element of identity. Religion. So the same Hindu who goes and murders a Muslim in a conflict, or the same Muslim who goes and kills Hindus in a conflict, that person may have many different identities which he or she, usually a he in most of these conflicts, chooses to completely submerge, completely submerge, abandon, disown, pretend he doesn't have them, pretends that the only part of that identity that is crucial is the person's religion. Not only his religion, but the religion of the person. He's kidding. Who's his antagonist? Right? So this is what we have to try to understand. How is it that we begin to view identity so that it becomes almost a stable, fixed category rather than a relational category? Right? And we're going to look at this in much greater detail on Thursday. So be sure you've done the readings for this week, because the argument is going to become much more clear to you if you've done the readings.